let's continue with uh, a review of uh, the Czech uh, uh, Republic, uh, the politics of the Czech Republic, the parties, the elections since 1989. So what uh, we know uh, for sure already is that uh, the Czech Republic right, is one of the successor states of uh, uh, Czechoslovakia. Right? In 1993, <coughs> the leaders of the Slovak part uh, and of the Czech part uh, decided to uh, separate uh, because clearly uh, that was where their you know, nation-building, state-building process was taking them at that point. Uh, before that, right in 1989, you, we have the changes we have covered. Uh, 1989, Havel uh, uh, is elected the uh, president uh, by the parliament of Czechoslovakia, right? Uh, Czechoslovakia transformed into a federative state, which turns out to not be enough. 1992, there is uh, uh, an election, uh, actually, in 1990, there is an election uh, which is won, obviously, as in uh, Poland, as in Hungary, by the you know, so-called opposition uh, uh, forces, right? Communists are outed, right? That's that's the common, those are the common phenomena. Uh, the prime minister becomes uh, in 1990 Václav Klaus, who will introduce the famous shock therapy uh, economic reforms that we have uh, we have discussed uh, already. Okay, but that's that as a framework, right? Uh, let's focus though on the Czech Republic because that's you know that's what we uh, are discussing. Uh, so basically, we have to start around 1992 uh, without ignoring the, the previous years, the previous period. So the Czech Republic. That's what do you know about the state? Right? From a <coughs> federative state, uh, Czechoslovakia, the Czech Republic, and Slovakia both actually will become uh, unitary states. Right? They are uh, relatively small, and uh, the Czech part is relatively hom homogeneous, although with some German minority. Still, you know the history, so it comes as no uh, surprise. And also, with a, uh, with a <coughs> significant uh, uh, regional uh, history, right, and identity, right? We, we have talked about the fact that the Czech Republic, what today we call the Czech Republic, actually uh, was uh, uh, in history, right? Uh, throughout history, was not there was no such thing. It was actually um, uh, there were actually uh, several provinces. Right, and the one that was uh, most more notable, and we talked about it, was Bohemia. And you have this map, nice map on on canvas, which uh, shows you both the historical provinces and today's administrative uh, regions: Bohemia, Moravia. Right, these were the two historical provinces, and Silesia. Silesia, which is how part of it is in Czech, Czech Republic today, and part of it is actually in Poland. It was also a matter of dispute between these two countries uh, in the interwar period. Okay, um, so it's a unitary state. Uh, that's that's an important thing to note. Um, uh, they passed a, a constitution early on in 1992. Well, why? Well, obviously because that's when the Czech Republic is actually formed. The other countries we most of, many of the other countries we study will not need to pass a new constitution immediately because they had a functioning constitution frame. Right? And what is the constitution? Is a basic document that describes the political the, the state and the main political institutions. Uh, distributes power, uh, describes how much power these political uh, institutions have and what's, what are the relationships between them and also describes the relationship between the citizen and the political system, right? That's, that's sort, of a basic <coughs> sort of a basic framework, the basic DNA, the blueprint of the, of, the, of the political system, of the state and of the political system. That's what the constitution is. It doesn't have to be a document. The UK does not have one written document called the constitution. Okay, so the constitution is passed in ninety two, of course, because that's when the Czech Republic is actually formed from uh, uh, Czechoslovakia. So that's that's interesting. Then uh, let's talk about the political system. Uh, as we discussed, <laughs> according to appearances, right, this this looks uh, like a parliamentary system, but it is either a parliamentary system with a much stronger president than usual, or Arguably, and I would argue that it has been moving and has moved actually towards a very weak semi-presidential system, and that you know the kind of the cutting point of this is is clearly a, a couple of years ago when uh, they have changed the method of electing the president from electing uh, being elected by the parliament to direct election, and whatever an institution is direct elected in a representative democracy, that automatically implies that that institution has 
power, has prestige, has a popular mandate. The source of power, political power, in a representative democracy is the popular mandate. Right? So switching to a direct election is, impli uh, you know, uh, is, implicit, uh, is implicitly giving the president more power, even if not formally. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing that has, uh, has, has influenced uh, this description that I just gave you of the political system, that it's not, it's in between the two maybe, right? Or maybe by now a weak, weak semi-presidential system, um, is, um, so let's look at some of the factors that allow us to say, you know, this thing, that it's either a, pre a parliamentary to strong president or a weak semi-presidential. Well, one is again that the, now the president is directly elected by the population. That's a huge thing, right? Uh, second thing is that uh, uh, the, the impact always of, of the political context, right? And in this case is the impact of uh, some of the, those who occupy the position of president. I mean, even the presence in the U.S. has been shaped and created in many ways what it is, what it means, the powers it has uh, by those who occupy the position, who have occupied the position. Lincoln and so on, FDR and so on. So in this case we have Havel, right? Havel, this towering uh, moral authority that he had, right? Which it, it was inevitable, just like Balesa shaped the position, and just like uh, in Hungary, um, actually the president was not such a powerful personality, but the PM was. You know these things shape the 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 the, the, the positions that the given individuals occupy. So in the in, in the Czech Republic, it's Havel, right? Havel who was not only elected in 1980, not only became president in 1989, was actually elected for the first time, uh, was actually elected in, uh, uh, in 1992, and, and remember the president was elected for five uh, years by the parliament at that point, so he was elected in uh, 1992 and 1998, if I'm not mistaken, so twice in any case, um, just to make sure that I have the, the uh, dates, uh, Right, and of course you have all these elections on uh, campus. 1993, right? 1993 and 1998, yes. So, um, so that's about basically, uh, uh, Havel is president until 2003, right? So between 1989 and 2003, right? That's the entire 90s decade. That is the entire 90s decade and a part of the 2000s, right? Um, that continuity will not be, uh, that sort of continuity will not be present in the parliament, in the, in the legislative side. So you have an ongoing president with tremendous moral authority, but you will not have such a stable, you know, continuous uh, majority in the parliament, in the legislature. But that also contributes. This stability and that stature, this continuity uh, in the position of the president combined with the moral stature, stature <laughs> of what's uh, happened. Furthermore, the one who will follow, the, the, the person who will become president after Havel will be Václav Klaus. Václav Klaus, who if you remember was the first PM of Czechoslovakia, then was elected, won an election and was PM of the Czech Republic, and he was the architect of the shock therapy. Now, you know, he is a very strong personality, kind of butted heads with Havel as well, he's a, he's a very kind of a Thatcher, longer Thatcher-like personality and you know, his views on the economy are similar, you know, free market and so on. So, a powerful personality. Uh, clearly, he will also shape uh, the position of the president. So, the second president, who, who uh, became president in 2003, Klaus, also will be a powerful president. And he will push the limits of what the president is supposed to do, allowed to do, uh, several times. For example, one, uh, some, uh, to certain, uh, to one moment, he will refuse or he will drag out the signing of a treaty. Now, in a parliamentary system, or uh, the president uh, has the role to sign law, right? He can veto, he can send it back to, he cannot veto, he can send it back to the parliament for revision, but he has to, uh, you know, he's formally signed. Right? Now, he used this tool, which is usually mostly formal in a parliamentary system, to uh, force certain concessions uh, before uh, signing the treaty, the uh, the, one of the major European treaties, right? Uh, major European Union treaties, right? So the Czech Republic, after it entered the European Union, there was a major treaty called the Treaty of Lisbon, 2007-8. And um, um, all the countries signed. 
imagine that, right? And this country that was just became part of the European Union in 2004, he, you know, actually refused to sign until certain changes, certain concessions were made, because he's a kind of a Euro skeptic, right? Uh, so it shows, right, that that he was pushing the, the limits of his presidency. The president who succeeded him, Milos Zeman, also used to be PM, used to be a party leader, is one of the most important figures in Czech politics. So you see, one after the other, you see, you see, you see, you see and you have these towering figures in Czech politics occupying the, uh, the position of a president. Uh, and that will shape uh, the position. Today, it's Milos Zeman, who, uh, again, a powerful figure, continuously pushes the boundaries of the position. Plus, he was, the last time, he was elected directly by the population. That gives him a very specific sort of a mandate in a representative democracy. Um, uh, and finally, so this is a, you know, a, another reason uh, the, who occupies the, the positions, the history of who occupied the position. And notice that it was the, well, some of these most prominent po uh, people in <coughs> Czech politics. Finally, as we will see, um, uh, Czech politics will, um, in a parliamentary system, right, the president asks uh, the leader of the ma majority party in, in the legislature to, to form the government. So you have elections, so here's the Czech political system, you have the Chamber of Deputies, you have Senate, right, and you have elections, and only the Chamber of Deputies election are uh, mean, uh, are uh, effective, uh, taken into consideration when nominating the Prime Minister, by the way. So, uh, Prime Minister and uh, Cabinet, and here's the President. Right? Pre uh, Chamber of Deputies is elected for four years, right? So the President is already there, right? You have an election, and normally the President should formally, right, just formally ask the leader of the majority party or coalition to form a government. But as we will see, and as the election uh, uh, results indicate, Actually, most of the times there was no majority government. Actually, many times it was always it was you know uh, election after election you had a minority government. And I explained in the previous lecture what the minority government means, right? Um, so in that case, you see, you know, here's the parliament. In that case, the president has tremendous leeway and a and a function that is uh, 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 formally, uh, well, a formality otherwise, right, becomes an actual power, an actual function, political, fu political function. So, so the president becomes introduced into the political game because he can ask this guy or this guy <coughs> to form the government since both of them would be a minority government. He has a choice, he becomes a part of it. And he also, after almost each election, the president had to play a role in mediating between these parties, helping them form a coalition uh, uh, that, that, that could form a government. Especially when Pavel uh, was present because of his moral authority, he had to play this role of mediator. Again, that introduces the president in the political game. Right? So here's another reason why we can argue uh, why, why the presidential position is more powerful than a normal parliamentary system, or why it is arguably something between a parliamentary and uh, semi-presidential uh, model, or arguably, as I was arguing, a very weak semi-presidential by now. Okay, so let's let's go and look over the political system then. Right, the president used to be elected by both houses every five years. In 2013, it changed, and the president is elected directly by the population, and that is 2013. Before it was both houses. Uh, the Chamber of Deputies is elected every four years, it has 200 members uh, through PR, while the uh, Senate is, uh, has 81 members, is elected, well, uh, two, one, uh, one third of these, one third of these uh, 81 members are elected every two years. Sounds familiar? Yes, I would guess it was the US model, one of the few impacts. Uh, so, we don't deal with the Senate because one third of it, it always changes composition. So this is why I didn't impose the elections. Also because it's the weaker House and the Chamber of Deputies. Also because the Senate cannot remove the Prime Minister and the Cabinet, and the composition of the Prime Minister and the Cabinet depends only on the Chamber of Deputies. So this is the House in which I focus the election <coughs> results. So 81 members, one third of them every two years. Okay. Set. Okay. 
so the prime minister and the cabinet, uh, so the cabinet is formed after each election, so every five, four years, uh, in, in depending on the majority of the Chamber of Deputies. Um, and here is where all that plays out that I just explained. Um, and um, it's important to note here that uh, when the prime minister, when the cabinet, uh, prime minister is, let's say, it's nominated by president as someone to, to become a prime minister, <coughs> based on the election results, and he forms a cabinet, the first thing the prime minister and the cabinet need to do is to pass a vote of confidence. Now, I explain what the vote of confidence is. But the vote of confidence in the chamber of deputies, and here's the test. This is why you need the majority, besides the fact that you need the majority in order to pass any law, right? And most laws will, you know, as in other uh, parliamentary or semi-presidential systems, law, most of the bills will come from the executive. We will prepare most of them, and then we will have to be passed by both houses. Now, uh, the point here is that the first thing that the prime minister of the cabinet needs to do is to need to do is to pass the vote of confidence. Now, you need a majority in order to pass such vote of confidence. Uh, so, majority matters, or at least you need the, the support, the mutual support, or the, an agreement with <coughs> other parties, so that if you're a minority government they agree not to remove you, because at any point they will be able to introduce a motion of no confidence, right? Which is the same thing, right? Uh, only that it starts from here. When, when a vote of no confidence is when the executive asks, right, introduces, asks for a vote of confidence. Uh, a motion of confidence is when it's, you know, started from the chain, right, from the legislature. Same thing, basically, a vote of confidence or no confidence. Only it comes from here or from here. But the point is that the Chamber of Deputies can introduce, you know, you have to uh, gather a number of signatures, whatever, but can introduce a motion of no confidence. If that passes at any time, <coughs> then the Prime Minister and the Cabinet are removed. So this is why it's important to maintain a mutual, uh, mutual formal, informal majority support, you know, the agreement that you are going to remove me, because otherwise I can't come. Okay. So, uh, the Chamber of Deputies is stronger than the Senate, uh, just like in Poland, uh, meaning that a law passed by the Chamber of Deputies can be uh, amended, changed, whatever, even rejected by the Senate, but the Chamber of Deputies can overturn uh, that rejection, can bypass that rejection with the uh, with a, with a majority. So, the Chamber of Deputies can pass a law to the, you know, opposition of the uh, of the Senate, except for, except for, as in other countries, certain issues that are uh, fundamental to the state. For example, amendments to the Constitution, international treaties being ratified, uh, ma important matters of defense and security. So such, in such things, and I posted some links on Canvas describing these powers and functions of each house, um, um, so, in, in such cases, amendments to the constitutions, fundamental treaties, and whatever military acts, both houses have the same power, so the Senate actually has a veto power. Also, the Senate's confirmation is needed for certain appointments in positions in the state, for example, constitutional court uh, and other superior judges, international agreements, and so on. So, the Senate does play roles, you know, um, you know uh, certain you know, important roles, but in the regular process of lawmaking and in, it, in the oversight of the legislature over the executive, by which I mean obviously the PM and the, and the cabinet, because the president cannot be removed by the legislature, <coughs> only by impeachment, that's a completely different thing, uh, the, the Senate does not favor. The composition of the cabinet and the removal of the cabinet and of the prime minister is based on the chamber of deputies. So it's, this is where it's important. Okay. Um, so I think that's, you know, in general, uh, that's a, a, a good uh, overview. Let me also note that there is a constitutional court, but you have the material on Canvas, so there is a constitutional court in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the Czech uh, Republic. And also take a look at the constitution uh, uh, document, uh, the preamble. I want you to take a look at the preamble of the constitution. Okay. So let's talk about politics in action then in the Czech Republic since 1990. So what can we say about the, you know, in, in all these countries we can talk about politics in the 90s versus politics in the 2000s. I think it's kind of, you can kind of separate and maybe even there's a third part to politics after 2010. There are certain commonalities in all, in all three um, uh, kind of 
having this kind of three periods. Uh, and there's some factors that reoccur, as you see. So in the 90s, well, you can guess already that, right, we talked about the fact that in the first election, 1919, still Czechoslovakia, the, the former opposition, right, is, uh, you know, what in uh, Poland was uh, uh, solidarity in the Czech, uh, in Czechoslovakia, well, in the Czech part, actually, of Czechoslovakia, was the civic forum, right? And public against violence was the equivalent in Slovakia, right? And obviously, in the first election, 1990, when the communists are kicked out, uh, is the civic forum from the Czech part and the public against violence in the Slovak part that sweep the elections. Again, united by, you know, why did they, they get votes? Because they were, they were um, standing for this common goal of, well, out with the communists. Right? But we all know that that's not, that's not going to last. Furthermore, this is also when prime minister is uh, uh, the prime minister uh, is uh, becomes Vasa uh, <laughs> uh, Klaus, the famous Vasa Klaus, who will introduce this shock therapy, which will turn out to have good effects, but immediately, just like in Poland, it will be very painful. So again, you see the similarities: Balcevich there, Václav Klaus here, shock therapy, shock therapy. That government that introduces shock therapy doesn't really, you know, there will be huge uh, backlash. So, um, next election is 1992, the first, you know, full regular elections. Um, in, and in these elections, uh, you have, you know, it's still Czechoslovakia, but basically these elections will also shape the, the Czech uh, Republic Parliament. Uh, and as a result of this uh, election, uh, Václav Klaus, uh, let me pull these up actually. So in 1992, uh, Chamber of Deputies National Council. National Council was the name of the par uh, Czech Parliament while there was Czechoslovakia. When they break up, it becomes Chamber of Deputies. And uh, that happens in 93 that they break up, right? So elections of 92 actually shape the Czech part in, in 92, while it's still part of Czechoslovakia, but also after 93 when it's separate Czech Republic. So anyway, elections in 1992, let's say it's elections for these elections for the Chamber of Deputies. Who wins the elections? Uh, you see, the civic forum is gone because just like in Poland, the solidarity fell apart, broke apart into various other uh, factions. It's just the same happens here with the civic forum, the same process that we have already covered. Why? Um, but, uh, so who, who wins? Uh, the Civic Democratic Party, ODS. ODS will become, as you have noticed by looking at the elections, the, uh, an ongoing feature of the Czech uh, uh, political life. And that's a good thing that they have one party or a couple, maybe, not even, uh, <laughs> which were more stable since the 1990s, unlike in Poland, as you noticed. Um, so ODS has been around and still around, yeah, so that's, that's kind of unique in many ways. Um, so they win the election, well, they don't obtain uh, a majority of the 200 seats, right, 76, but they form a coalition with Civic Democratic Alliance, ODA, which is also a post-Civic Forum kind of faction. So both of them are splinters from the Civic Forum. The head of the ODS, what's important, is Václav Klaus. And Václav Klaus, the famous, uh, you know, that economist the <coughs> who is, you know, an adept, uh, a supporter of shock therapy, laissez-faire economics, free market, slow taxes, uh, shock therapy, and so on. Uh, so they form a, a, a government in 1992. He continues these, these economic uh, policies in 1992. In 1993, uh, you have elections for the president. Remember that at this point, it is still these are still um, the president is still elected by the houses of the uh, parliament until 2013. That will be, remain the case. So this is when Václav Havel is elected as again, as president by the houses of the, of the Czech Republic now. So it's the first presidential election in the Czech Republic. The previous one in 1989 was in Czechoslovakia. Okay, so, but he, he's, he was already president, right, of Czechoslovakia. Um, now notice that the next election is in 1996, which means that the, um, that the, that the parliament uh, uh, and the cabinet uh, was in power for the full mandate, four years, which will not be always the case. And <coughs> here you see that the ODS will receive uh, uh, the less seats, and I want to point out the other major parties of the 90s, which is the Czech 
Social Democratic Party, Che, che, che SSD. Che SSD. But Che SSD, CSSD, right? This is not a reform communist party. That's important, or at least not as a party. Maybe some of the members. But it's not a reform communist party. In most of the other countries, the social democrats, in many cases, will actually be the reformed communists, you know, you know, kind of reformist communists who democratized themselves and became the Social Democratic Party and then changed generations and whatever. This is not, actually the Czech Social Democratic Party is a historical party. Remember that when we talked about which parties take, um, appear on the scene in the 1990s, I mentioned that one of the sources will be the pre-communist uh, pre uh, uh, you know, political system. Uh, historical parties were called, you know, uh, this is how they were called in the 90s. Meaning the parties that existed before communism came in and those parties, and they reform in the 90s. This is one of those, right? Uh, social democracy has a long history in the Czech Republic, or in, uh, in the Czech lands. So this is one of those, so that's important, because there's also a communist party of Bohemia and Moravia, and these are the communists. These are the communists who did not reform, so to speak, or uh, little did they reform, sort of nostalgic communists and so on. Not, uh, remember that the Czech Republic is one of the the Czech lands are one of the few cases, or maybe the only case, in, in the entire century in Europe where even before the war and the interwar period, before communism, there was a local native relevant, not important or uh, not the most important, but it was there a relevant communist uh, movement or group, right? Uh, <coughs> and not just, you know, one imported or a group of uh, illegals who because they were illegal in most of the other countries, the communist parties, uh, who, with the backing of the Soviet power, just, you know, took power. So in the Czech Republic, although they, the Soviet power will do the same thing, but be, even before that, there has been a communist movement. So it's important to keep that in mind. Again, not major, but it was there. So, and they uh, exist. They exist and they, uh, they still exist. And, you know, they harp on the nostalgia and whatever, if you remember the documentary that I posted on life in the, under communism in the Czechoslovakia, you see those people who would vote for these, uh, for this party, because they appear in that documentary, because they, you know, documentary being made in the 90s, and these people are saying, yeah, well, I lived well then, right? So, you know, there is a market, right, for, you know, not just nostalgia, but also, you know, it's for a specific age group, right, pensioners and so on, those more affected by economic transition, they look back at job security, they look back at, you know, guaranteed benefits from the state and whatever, and, you know, there's that sort of a, you know, it was better before. Okay, okay another important party, or another relevant party is the Christian Democratic uh, Union, which will be around until the 2000s. The Republican Party is an extreme right party. That's obviously nothing to do with the, what is it? Here it's called the Republican Party, whatever. It's just a name. Uh, <clears throat> but it's an extreme right sort of a, uh, you know, a xenophobic racist party. Uh, Civic Democratic Alliance, as I said, the splinter from the Civic Forum. Moravian, I, I left these in, although they didn't get any seats. Uh, I deleted many of the other parties that ran, because all just in the other countries, in the first elections especially, but not just, not only that, there's always many parties, 20, 30, you know, polling the first election, there was 100 parties uh, running for the first election. Well, here as well, but I, I don't, you don't need that information, you need to focus on the important part. And that means it because you see the name of the party, Moravia Center Union, Moravia National Party. Well, what's Moravia? It's one of the lands. And in, in many of these countries, which the states are fairly recent, who, whose history is actually a history of dif different or distinct provinces, you will have such parties representing or speaking up for the provinces. And these sort of regionalist parties, this is a feature of European politics, regionalist parties, in, in many countries. Parties that stand for the interests of those of that specific region. If the US would have a proportional representation system, PR, which uh, I explained what, uh, how it functions, uh, then, and not SMD, FPP, which it has, then there would be regionalist parties. There would be the party of the south, the party of the uh, midwest, or whatever. Or the northwest, or whatever. Okay, so, uh, 1996, you have, uh, again, ODS, 
forms the forms forms the government. Uh, but again, this will require intense negotiations, in which the president Václav Havel will play an important role. And here's exactly what I was talking about. Finally, the PM again is Václav Klaus, uh, the same guy who introduced shock therapy before, so he's been a PM and he forms a coalition, coalition with, coalition with uh, the Christian Democrats and the Civic Democratic Alliance, but what, can you, what do you notice about this coalition? It does not have a majority. 18 plus 13, right, that is 31, and 69, it's 99 seats, not 101. A majority is 101, uh, and so it's a minority norm. And I explained how that works in the previous uh, lecture. And in order to form a minority government, the other important uh, actors in the in the parliament, in the chamber of deputies, they need to give their consent. They need to promise that they will not remove uh, this cabinet and government because, well, again, uh, the cabinet needs to be instated through a vote of confidence. And it needs not to be removed later with a vote of no confidence. So they did do get that, and that is a good sign. The fact that they could achieve such a such a such a such an agreement with their major rivals, the social democrats, right? These are parties on the center right. right? This is center left, uh, the CSSD, CSSD, right? The social Democrats, and the social Democrats um, uh, agreed to give them such support. Uh, the fact that they <coughs> would agree to that is, 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 is a sign of stability. It's a sign of stability and, uh, you know, maturity in many ways. Because that's not a given. It is not a given. The fact that they put the stability of the system ahead of other interests is, is, a, is a plus. Of course, they also got some benefits from that. So the head of CSSD, uh, Milos Zeman, whose name we'll encounter later. Uh, Milos Zeman, uh, who is the current president, right? Milor Zeman uh, becomes the speaker of the, of the Chamber of Deputies, which is also a very important position. So, there's this negotiation. Okay, next election is 1998 for the presidency. Again, who elected the uh, Chamber and, uh, of Dep the Deputies and the Senate? Again, Václav Havel is re elected, gives you a sense give you, uh, of, his, uh, of his authority, of his position in the Czech society. Um, and of uh, you know, and now I understand how important it is that it was him who was the president in the early years of the presidency. Okay, uh, 1998. There is a chamber of deputies election. So as you see, these are early elections because normally the next elections should have been in 2000. So 1998, you have a, a chamber of deputies election, which follows. Uh, which happens because, uh, because of the, co the coalition government led by Václav Klaus fa falls apart. Václav Klaus resigns in 1997. There are some financial scandals, so there is a lot of problems. And uh, you know the government resigns. When the government resigns in either a parliamentary or some presidential system, new elections have to be held. Um, uh, if the existing, you know, if the existing parliament does and cannot produce another government. Well, in this case, obviously, it could not produce another government. So there you have elections in 1998. And uh, the two major factions in 1998 are, again, the same, right? Center-right with the uh, ODS, the Civic Democratic Party, center-right, center right? Free market, kind of Eurosceptic, right? Like Vatsa Klaus is he's himself, Eurosceptic, which means that we want back in the European Union, but still, you know, hanging on to sovereignty and kind of more, uh, sovereign, more sovereign minded, more like Thatcher, really. Like Thatcher is a good model of, uh, of Watson Klaus, you know, so free market, less suffer, and so on. So, center right, also Christian Democrats, center right, and Freedom Union, which is a new actor, which was a breakaway from ODS, probably, uh, you know, opposing Watson Klaus, again, a very strong personality, uh, but still center right. Um, so, these are the center right. Then you have a new party uh, here, a Green Party, which doesn't obtain any seats, but it's here, it's an eco uh, ecologist uh, party. And remember, uh, for reference again, look at that video lecture on political ideologies, because that's where I, you know, I address some of these major currents. Like, there's no time to do it in these lectures, so use that to clarify what these words mean, what is a Christian Democrat and so on. Okay, uh, the Republican parties, those extreme right, they do not get into the parliament. Now, 
remember that the Chamber of Deputies elections are by PR with a threshold of 5%. 5% for parties, and then you have 10% for coalitions made of two parties, 15% for a coalition made of three parties, and a 20% threshold for a coalition made of four parties or so. So you have a varied threshold for one party, the threshold is 5%. They don't get 5%. Um, okay, um, so you have two major forces, right? Center right, Freedom Union, Christian Democrats, ODS, but remember, Freedom Union is a breakaway from ODS, so they will not form a coalition because they just broke away. Right? That government just fell, probably because of this. Right? <coughs> then you have on the center left the Social Democrats, but who else is on the left is the Communists. Well, the Social Democrats don't want to make a government with the Communists six years after the revolution, right? after the Velvet Revolution, or what is it, eight years. Uh, so it's a conundrum. Uh, none of these uh, two sides can form a majority. None of the individual parties have a majority, which in multi-party systems is obvious, right? So what's going to happen next? Well, guess what? Yes, you have guessed correctly. It's going to be, again, a minority government. So minority governments, you know, the fact that the Czech Republic could manage to have minority governments uh, so often in the, in the 90s, and, uh, and not only, and to function and to introduce some strong reforms, uh, economic and else, uh, otherwise, that is again a sign of stability. That is again a sign of stability, which is not true for other political systems, let's say in Western Europe, for example, Italian political system. If you take my course on Western European politics, you'll see. Um, okay, uh, so there's a social democratic uh, uh, minority government, um, 74 of, uh, one of 200 seats, the prime minister becomes Miloš Zeman. And again, in order to function and to be a minority government, it needs a silent, mutual, informal, whatever support of the other actors in the Chamber of Deputies, and they will get that from ODS. So ODS will agree not to introduce a motion of no confidence that numerically could defeat this, this government. Okay, next election is in 2002. So just to, to draw a conclusion here, as you, as you saw in the 1990s, what is going on? There are, most of them are minority governments, but it's clear that there are two major poles, right? And it's fairly stable poles, although parties come and go, fracturing and so on, but there are kind of stable two poles anchored on the right, on the, on the ODS, uh, civic, um, uh, the Civic Democratic Party, and on the left on the uh, Social Democrats. Right? And that is kind of a two-pole thing, and then around them other parties move, uh, fraction and so on, fracture and so on. To the far left you have the, the, the communists though. Right? Uh, and so that's kind of, you know, fairly stable thing, fairly stable thing in that sense, right? Uh, the, the ODS won two elections, Social Democrats wins the, the third, so even the automation in power is not as radical, you know? So, with all this fluctuation, there is a sort of a stability, right? So think of the fact that in the 90s, the Czech Republic has only two prime ministers. That's, that's a big thing. That's a big thing that they only have two prime ministers, compared with other centuries in European countries. Okay, 2002, again, who wins the election? The, the Social Democrats. So, again, you see about a sign of stability, right? Um, uh, and the, the, the rivals are, you know, ODS again, of course. <coughs> There's the communists uh, are also there. Christian Democrats are also there, which now in a, in a, in a coalition with that Freedom Union. Republicans still not, do not get in the parliament. Civic Democratic Alliance, that faction that broke from the Civic Forum, falls completely out of the parliament because it only obtains 0.50. 0.5 of vote, uh, another Republicans, the, the extreme right, extremist parties tend to fracture easily. Uh, you see there are two of them. The Roma Civic Agency, I wanted to also include it here, although it didn't get anything irrelevant. And there are no reserve spots for the Roma in the, the Jeeps population, in the, uh, which is an ethnic group, Roma, uh, Romani. Um, there are no reserve spots in the Chamber of Deputies um, for them which might be a, one of the solutions to the problems that, uh, you know, Czech society has with the Romani population. We'll talk about that. 
Um, okay, so anyway, you see there are four, actually only four, parties that get in the parliament. Um, and, <coughs> but none of, none of them have enough to form a coal uh, coalition. The civic democrats with the Christian democrats and freedom union cannot form one. They don't have enough. Uh, the social democrats don't want to allow themselves to the communists. So, again, of course, you will have what? Uh, uh, a minority government, of course. A minority government. Uh, at this point, it's not uh, uh, Milos Zeman who um, remains prime minister, although the Social Democrats win again, right? And he was the prime minister. He, pr he actually promised to retire. He actually left the party, formed uh, his own party, uh, and actually later will run for the presidency, actually the next, uh, uh, later run for the presidency. But um, uh, right now, Milor Zeman is out, uh, so there's a different person from, uh, from the Social Democrats whom Havel asks, right? Havel is still president. It's, what, 13 years after the uh, revolution, uh, he, uh, at the end of his second mandate now. He asks uh, Vladimir Spidla of Social Democrats to form, uh, again, a minority government. And again, the other parties, ODS and... Um, uh, the Christian Democrats agree to, to not you know, remove him, to not pass a motion for Congress. 2003, you have the next election for the president. Uh, again, parliamentary election, so elected by the two houses. And who gets elected? Our old friend Václav Klaus is elected, the, who used to be prime minister from ODS, reformist, Thatcherite, whatever, uh, you know, the, the free market guy, Eurosceptic. Right? I've seen he becomes president, again, a very powerful figure, as ever. Uh, then, notice that the next election is in 2006. 2002 to 2006, so this parliament actually spent he, the entire mandate, it, there were no uh, early elections. <coughs> and notice a big thing here in 2006. What? If you look at the, at the results, uh, you will notice that, uh, well, big thing. An important thing is that you know the, the social democrats lose. Uh, the um, Green Party gets into the parliament. The Freedom Union gets out of the parliament. I included the Slow and Justice Party because it kind of recently, right? It should remind you of the name of the party from Poland, and it's very possible that it was formed because of the Law and Justice Party in Poland, which was so successful. There are these inter-effects in Central Eastern Europe from one country to the other. It depends on which countries, right? Uh, models are trans translated. Uh, just like it happens in Western Europe, by the way. Okay, um, so here it's... Uh, <laughs> again, right? Again, there is no clear uh, uh, majority because no matter how you, how you turn it, you will not... It's very, it will be very hard to get a uh, uh, majority. So what happens in 2000? Six. Well, if you make the, do the math, what do you see? Let's, let's do the math here. Um, in uh, uh, 2006, you have 81 seats, ODS has 81 seats. If it enters into a coalition with the Christian Democrats, that's 94 plus 6 from the Green Party, that's what? 100 seats. So in the 2006 elections, both sides, kind of the two poles, left and right, have exactly 100 seats. 100 seats. In a chamber of deputies of 200. Where you need 101 to have a majority, right? To form a government or to survive a motion of no confidence. So, stalemate of some sort, where a uh, deadlock in which Either alternative cannot have 101 votes. And obviously, all of them can claim the right to form such a minority government because, you know, between these two parties, there's only seven, seven seats. It's true, however, that there is an increased legitimacy for all the to claim the right to form uh, a government because still they obtained most of the votes, but not the majority, right? So what happens? Well, it takes about eight months for anything to really uh, to, to, to be solved, for the situation to be solved. At first, ODS forms a, a minority government with no uh, coalition, uh, but it did not does not manage to 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 negotiate with the other parties who to to get that mutual support, to get that formal support. So actually. 
the government is for, meaning uh, there is a PM, Mira Topolanek, and he is, uh, there is a cabinet, but uh, they do not pass the initial vote of confidence. So actually, that government never forms. Right? Okay, back to the drawing board. More months, uh, are, uh, several months are, uh, 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 are passed, and in over, overall, eight months, basically. Uh, and then there is a still minority coalition government of civic democrats, ODS, with Christian Democrats, Natural Allies, and the Greens, and the Ecologists, the Green Party, which got into the parliament. And that's exactly 100, right? But how do they pass this motion of confidence, <coughs> the initial motion of confidence, 100, right? Well, a few deputies, two or three, from the Social Democrats simply don't show up. And not showing up means that among those present, this coalition will have the majority. And not showing up was a way of not voting for this government and against their party. So social democrats, you know, they couldn't vote against their own party, right? But not showing up is kind of allows this government to, to form, because they will have 100 votes against 97 or so, and that's majority among those present, right? Uh, so it's a, it's a mutual way of allowing them to form as a government but uh, not voting against their own government. So, that's uh, 2006, and in the next period, actually, you see the Social Democrats will continue to be very unhappy with <laughs> having them in power, and this government will actually survive four, counted four, votes of no confidence. That's something, that is something. Okay, 2008, you have the next presidential election. Uh, again, the two chambers elect, uh, every five years, the president, Václav Klaus, is re-elected for a second mandate as president. Again, continuity there, fluctuations on in the legislature. And he's a strong personality. Uh, 2010. 2010, Chamber of Deputies, the next scheduled elections. Um, next scheduled elections, but it's sort of earlier. It's sort of earlier because it happens because the Prime Minister, Mirab Topolanek, loses finally a vote of no confidence, the ODS Prime Minister, after four failed attempts by the Social Democrats to remove him the fifth, finally. Why? Because the ODS itself has fractured. So ODS it itself has fractured, uh, sort of rivals of Topolanek or enemies or whatever it is, uh, from his own party vote against him in Parliament, and that's how he loses eventually the vote of no confidence. Remember, the other parties could not pass either a vote. In order to pass a vote of no confidence, you still need a majority. Both sides, both polls, had exactly 100 in, among two, of, out of 200. Uh, so, either, for either side to pass a vote of confidence or no confidence, needed either votes from the other side or the absence of their own people. Anyway, so the PM Topolanek is removed through a vote of no confidence in 2009, uh, but uh, actually, they don't call elections in 2009, but in, um, instead form a technocratic government. And this is another term that I, I wanted to, to know, technocratic government, because also it returns in centuries European politics, technocratic. What is a technocratic? Also in European politics, not in the US. Technocratic means it's a government of specialists. It's this sort of an idea of, uh, we're going to ask a group of people who know how to run the administration, how to run the government, who are not politicians, are not from any of the political parties, they're just economists, whatever, uh, you know, engineers, whatever it is, the job that they need to do, they have specialty, uh, they have uh, specialty, they come from that profession, and we're going to ask them to run the country. We are not going to, you know, uh, they're going to run it, the machinery of the country. It's not going to be a political government, that's the point. But a techno, you know, uh, a government of those who have the technique, who have the, the, the knowledge, the sp sp specialized professional knowledge in their field. For example, I'm going to ask, ask an agricultural engineer to run the Ministry of Agriculture, and so on, and so on, and so on, right? But these are not going to come from parties, they're going to be non party government. So the PM and the cabinet will be just specialists. And that's a technocratic government. And it, it, it has been used and it is used in Western countries, especially when the political parties cannot agree on forming a government, because you need to have a, a running government still, right? You ask people who know how to run it on a day-to-day -day basis, 
What is the weakness of such governments is that it's like kind of like managers who are hired by city councils in the US. That's a US typical model where there is a city council that is elected, but there is no mayor, but they hire a specialist to run the city. Right? Kind of like the same thing. But what's the weakness of this system is that a technocratic government, by definition, does not have a majority. I'm going to stop here and continue with the second part. 